In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of all that is good and Master of life, Come, dwell within us, Cleanse us from all stain, And save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, Pray for us. Well, today we're going to work on uh, the 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Uh, And the theme is still Eucharistic. It's beautiful how this, as we go through these warm summer months, the liturgy is instructing us on how we're strengthened and fortified by the Word and the body. And so, I want to talk first now about the sacramentality of the Word. We've been looking at that. I want to give you, we read that other text in um, Verbum Domini, number 35, 36. I want to read you one now from number 19 and try to develop a bit because it's quite beautiful. This is the Pope now. A key concept for understanding the sacred text as the Word of God in human words is certainly that of inspiration. That's what he's talking about in this part of the Verbum Domini. Here, too, we can suggest an analogy. As the Word of God became flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so sacred scripture is born from the womb of the Church by the power of the same Spirit. Sacred Scripture is, and he's quoting here, the Word of God set down in writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's from De Verba at the Council. And then he goes on, St. Ambrose, on the duty of ministers, that's a quote from him. In this way, one recognizes the full importance of the human author who wrote the inspired text, and at the same time God himself as the true author. So, he's pointing to a dimension of tradition that has not been well recognized for a long time. That is how uh, the Word of God became flesh in the Virgin Mary. And that Word delivered by the angel received into her being, you see, was the way by which the Word of God himself took up life in her flesh. And she's the model for the way the Church should hand on the Word and the way the Church should receive the Word. Uh, it's that powerful. And uh, we've we already seen the other text where uh, the Pope, again, uh, invoking a long, a very long tradition of the Church, you see, which says that the uh, Word of God is food. And then we have those beautiful texts, we've looked at them, of uh, receiving and living by, and that that Word of God at the liturgy of the Word at the, at the Mass, that Word of God is analogous. The presence of Christ there is analogous to the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, in the bread and wine after the consecration. And for the same reason, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. So what I want to do now is just look at some texts uh, from the Fathers of the Church and from some modern authors to try to awaken in us this sense so that when the reader stands up there the Sunday and says, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans or whatever the first reading would be, wouldn't be usually from Romans. Um, you're alert. Now the Holy Spirit is going to be alert in you so that you can receive this word and have it literally, not like Mary, but literally take flesh into your mind, your emotions, your heart, your will, and and be part of you. We've lost that sense. Um, I'm going to be utilizing, while I do this, the work of a very fine uh, uh, young uh, Lutheran minister uh, who uh, did his doctorate on this, 
taking his inspiration from that text of, Saint, of Pope Benedict I just quoted. And when I get to those quotes, I'll, uh, I'll let you know that I'm getting them from Pastor Genig. Okay. Uh, now, St. Ambrose is one of the ones who says, now when we talk about Mary, that is the Church, or when we talk about the Church, that is Mary, there's some mystery there that has escaped us in modern times. And yet, Hugh Rahner, this is the brother of Karl Rahner, has a whole book called Our Lady and the Church, and it's just full of these kind of statements about the uh, interpenetration of Mary and the Church. Here's one now from St. Ambrose. How beautiful are those things which have been prophesied of Mary under the figure of the Church. Prophesied about the, you know, talking about the Church, but in an ultimate sense, talking about Mary. Her womb bore the Christ, just as the Church's womb, the baptismal font, gives birth and conceives Christians. This, as I'm sure you know, is a, a constant theme in the early fathers of the Church and in the liturgies. Now, this one is from uh, the Pope. Uh, we, I guess it was before he was Pope. Uh, it's in his book, The Church at the Source, that he wrote along with um, uh, von Balthasar. The dogma of Mary's freedom from original sin is at bottom meant solely to show that it is not a human being who sets the redemption in motion by her own power. Rather, her yes is contained wholly within the promise and priority of divine love, which already embraces her before she's born. That's why she's conceived immaculately, and that's why uh, she can respond immaculately. Uh, St. Augustine has this lovely phrase that I think I've saved for you here somewhere. Um, where he says that Prius concepit in mente quam in corpore. Our Lady had first received um, I didn't bring it with me I guess. But anyway, believe me, he said it. And so did St. Leo after him. Primus in mente quam in ventre. First she conceived the word in her mind. How often did she ponder the scriptures in her life? And they took on a disposition to become flesh. I'll put it that way. Uh, now this is St. Thomas. The word is joined to the sensible sign. Just as in the mystery of the incarnation, the word of God is united to flesh by vehicle of the word. Okay? And now here's John Damascene. And through the incarnation, the overpowering power, overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit becomes a rainfall. That's like the way we speak now in Canon 2. Send down your Holy Spirit like the dewfall upon these elements and make them the body and blood of Christ. Okay. For just as all things whatsoever God made, he made by the operation of the Holy Spirit. So also it is by the operation of the Spirit that those things are done which surpass nature and cannot be discerned except by faith alone. And here's an example. How shall this be done? asked the Blessed Virgin, because I know not man. The ancient Archangel Gabriel answered, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And now you ask how the bread becomes the body of Christ, and the wine and water the blood of Christ, and I tell you, the Holy Spirit comes down and works these things which are beyond description and understanding. You see the parallel there, there? They're discovering. Uh, and now, just some other texts. These uh, I'm uh, borrowing from Pastor Genick. But it happens to us to honor and adore the undivided Trinity we worship and celebrate the praises of Mary Ever Virgin, who is the temple of the Holy God and the same Son, the Immaculate Bridegroom. To God be glory forever and ever. And that's from Cyril of Alexandria in a homily he gave at the Council of Ephesus in 431. 
this is a modern, this is Henri de Lubac. As far as the Christian mind is concerned, Mary is the ideal figure of the Church, the sacrament of the Church, and the mirror in which the whole Church is reflected. Everywhere the Church finds in her type and model, her point of origin and perfection. For the form of our mother, the Church, is according to the mother of his son. That's to Lubeck. I'm trying to point out, you see, that as we explore this, the, the model for receiving the Word of God is Mary. And she so powerfully received that Word that by the action of the Holy Spirit, the special overpowering of the Holy Spirit, that Word became literally flesh in her and was born a human being, united to the Word of God, the very substantial, infinite Word of God. But that's the process that's meant to take place in our life, particularly at the liturgy, but also in that continuation of the reading of the scriptures at the liturgy, which we do in our own reading. It's not a private reading. We're never private. How can we be private? We're part of the body of Christ. So as we let that happen to us, it affects the whole body of Christ. Um, now, uh, Here's a text from uh, a runner. Uh, this is a uh, Hugh runner. Thus the early church saw Mary and the church as a single figure, type and antitype, form one print as seal and wax. And Irenaeus of Ly Lyons, whose thought derives from Polycarp, the disciple of John, and therefore directly from the heart of Christ himself, sees in the words of the angel to Our Lady a prophecy of the Church's kingdom to come. Isn't that remarkable? You will conceive and bear in your womb a, son, a child, and he will be called Son of the Most High. Okay. But at the same time, you are in a mysterious way conceiving the Church. You see, and that's why the baptismal font is called the womb of the Church. Uh, I know these ideas are somewhat new, uh, but they're important. Um, thus we find ourselves at the heart of the early church, teaching about Our Lady and the Church. This is the fundamental doctrine that Mary is a type or symbol of the Church, and therefore everything that we find in the Gospel about Mary can be understood in a proper biblical sense of the mystery of the Church. Isn't that marvelous? The Church gives birth to the Christ in us through the baptismal font. Uh, can you see how these thoughts and these images and this teaching is so powerful? And that's why uh, Pope Benedict, as Pope, uh, again, I can read that for you. It's uh, Verbum Domini number 19, uh, where he says this, and I'll read it, read it by way of conclusion, because it's quite remarkable. A key concept for understanding the sacred text as the word of God in human words is certainly that of inspiration, which we'll be talking about later. Here, too, we can suggest an analogy. As the word of God became flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so sacred scripture is born from the womb of the Church by the power of the same Spirit. Now, that means what? That by anticipation, Israel is forming an anticipated womb of the church because those scriptures were formed before the Lord was conceived in the womb of Mary. I hope you don't find that too abstract or too confusing. Uh, the main point I want you to get from it, and I hope you get it, is the awesome beauty of the written word of God as bearing the Christ to us. And if we learn to receive it as she did, Mary, even before she conceived the word in her womb, she was reading the scriptures. And that's why both St. Augustine and St. Leo say she conceived the word in her mind before she conceived him in her body. Amen.